Hello, I'm Tommy. Hi, Tommy. I'm Carl. Have a seat. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I love this town. Pittsburgh is an awesome town. So you were an artist. I, I worked on Speed Racer. Uh, the gentleman who created Speed, Speed Racer, Mr. Tatsuo Yoshida, he passed away in 77. Uh, but I, uh, Speed Racer was one of the most formative series uh, you know, of my childhood. Uh, I saw it when I was very small, either in the St. Louis or Chicago suburban areas. Uh, enjoyed it very, very much. Um, and uh, uh, I still kept some sketches I did as a little kid. And I was very honored to work on Speed Racer. Um, this was uh, in the late 90s, around 98. Uh, this was uh, Wildstorm Productions, right as it was being acquired by DC Comics. I had worked on a comic series, uh, a comic reboot, uh, in the anime style. Um, prior to that, comics were usually printed with uh, lower quality inks and papers. And uh, I decided, uh, because Wildstorm was one of the few comic companies that were digitally producing their comics from beginning to end all the way through, and this was in the 90s, um, uh, that uh, I would use production techniques uh, with the comics and work with the staff to make it look like cell anime, which was very, very new to comics. This was a few years before the Transformers comics hit it big, and it was a huge success. Uh, a lot of people really liked it. Um, it was a lot more like the old anime speed racers ra rather than being uh, an Americanized version. Um, and then uh, uh, that was... Uh, licensed by Tatsunoko Productions, uh, a Japanese animation company, uh, highly revered in Japan, uh, goes back many, many years, um, uh, which was founded by the creator of Speed Racer, Mr. Tatsuo Yoshida. And another one of the series that they had produced, uh, that Tatsunoko had produced, was uh, the three different anime series that make up Robotech. And through that kind of interesting convoluted path, I started working on Robotech uh, trying to get the comics made, and then I ended up working at the company, Harmony Gold, who licensed it for the U.S. market. And hence, uh, I came into the Robotech fold, and I uh, largely work on Robotech now. Right. So tell me a little bit about your parents wanted you to be an engineer. Oh, yes. And you... So you read my, you read my bio. A little bit. Okay. And so you, you rejected that? No, I didn't reject it. What happened? I, my parents wanted me to be an engineer because my father was a very good one. Uh, he was a uh, professor of engineering, a uh, very young age, at about 30. And uh, uh, he, you know, it, it just kind of made sense. You know, I thought, hey, I, I would go into engineering like my father did. I uh, uh, got, got into the U UCLA School of Engineering. Uh, it just, uh, once I was in school, it just wasn't my uh, cup of tea uh, when I was at UCLA. I actually spent more time at the School of Design than I did at the School of Engineering. And uh, then I kind of, uh, it was a good um, soul searching experience. And then I ended up at the, the Art Center College of Design instead nearby. and. Uh, uh, that's where I ended up studying afterwards. Do you find it, at, at what point does a, a comic book artist or a sketch artist start to find amusement in the fact that you are actually really successful doing what you're doing? I mean, because <coughs> what I'm getting at here is mm -hmm. that, well, basically, you're living the dream. Uh, the grass is always greener on the other side. Uh, people think that comic book work is very glamorous. You talk to a lot of comic book artists, you see them in comic conventions. It's fun. You're, you're surrounded by the, um, the business of it, you know, the, the fandom of it. But it, when it comes down to it, it's a living, uh, like everything else. And in order for it to work, you have to be extremely dedicated to it. It's something you have to love to do. Because as a living, it's very hard. Uh, you have to work hard, and all the people who have been in it long term, were, you know, uh, have put their lives, poured their lives into it for the long run. Because as a short term, uh, as a living, you know, unless uh, you're very aggressive, you, f uh, you find how to make the business work, it's, it's really hard to make a living, especially even more so now, uh, you know, than before. Because uh, as Egon and Grossbusters said, print is dead. Uh, the market is undergoing a huge seismic shift 
in delivery of the medium from traditional print to digital and how the business model shakes out, how the revenue comes in so people can build their livelihoods on this. It completely hasn't worked itself out yet. Um, so a lot of the people who are the most successful people in the business, they're not just good artists, writers, creative people, they're also good business people. You know, they follow you know, how the general trends in the business are going and they swing with it. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, one of the most, uh, arguably one of the most successful comic artists ever, uh, Jim Lee, uh, he was uh, going to school at Princeton. He was going to study uh, to enter into the medical field, but he turned out to be an exceptional artist. And uh, he ended up find, founding his own, uh, own company, Wildstorm, where I worked. And then uh, with the DC acquisition, it was almost as if, uh, you know, uh, DC acquiring uh, a subsidiary of Warner Brothers taking over Wildstorm when in fact it was uh, Jim Lee's eventual takeover of DC. He's now uh, one of the publishers of the company. Uh, but then he also has, a, you know, uh, extraordinary business acumen. Uh, so I think it's, it, it's uh, uh, I, you know, the advice I would give to uh, up and coming people is you have to love the business, you have to be dedicated to it, and uh, don't just be pigeonholed into what you want to do, art, you know, writing, what have you. Uh, keep your eyes open for, you know, uh, big trends in the business as well. So you turn away from conventional society and decided to pursue art. At what point along your journey did you wake up in the morning and say, all of my hard work is finally coming together here. I can't believe it. How long did it take? I don't think it took very long. Even, in the, even when I was uh, out of school, starting to work in the early 90s, uh, because it's something I love to do. Uh, this is one thing that um, is interesting, is when it's something you love to do, uh, it's not that hard. You have to put in a lot of hard work. There's no way around that. But when it's something you love to do, uh, the hard work that you put into it becomes an addiction. You know, uh, you want to do it. And so I think that's one of the things uh, I tell folks is pursue what your heart tells you to go for, towards. Because if you go into a field where your heart is not into it, it does become hard work. And it becomes even harder because you're not enjoying it. Whereas if you enjoy it, there are things where other people will go, man, that's hard. And you go, yeah, it's going to be damn hard, and I'm going to love every minute of it. And then you accomplish things where other people go, damn, how do you do that? That was hard, because you loved every minute of it. And, uh, and you, know, I, I, you know, like you said, I, I never turned away from conventional society. I hope that, in reality, that uh, that's the way society is. is. Society is open enough to um, have the flexibility to allow for this kind of uh, creativity, for people to kind of color outside the lines, outside of social norms. Uh, you know, that's, that makes it easier for us to find, you know, uh, diverse people with great interests. Um, what was interesting is about 20 years ago, it was really hard to find people with this, um, who get anime, uh, especially the artwork. If you see comics in the 90s, there were very few adaptations that got the look right. But now that a whole generation of kids have been deluged with this material, have grown up around it, have lived it, now by comparison it's actually e you know, uh, relatively easier to find a wide range of American raised artists who are familiar with the medium and uh, can deliver what you want. There, there's a lot of these social games you know, for the iPhone where you go, wow, that looks like an import game from Japan, but it was done with American artists who just love the genre. Um, but anyway, get, getting back to uh, you know, uh, when I discovered I made it, I don't know if I ever sat back and had time to go you know, uh, rest on my laurels and say, wow, gee, you know, I'm, I'm glad I did this. Uh, usually I'm just so busy where, you know, I'm, I work on a, uh, I, I started in video games. Um, and I worked on a video game, I enjoyed it, it was a lot of fun, and then you just go right from, I went right from the video game to comics. That was a weird jump actually. Uh, video games was an exploding market that people were thinking, here's an exploding medium, and here's comics, an imploding medium, why are you doing that? That's, isn't that going to be really hard? And I said, yeah, but I'm going to enjoy it. 
and I enjoyed it. The comic did well, and then I moved on to other things, you know, home video, uh, animation, uh, and uh, now also, you know, I uh, work on doing licensing, so a uh, wide range of stuff uh, related to pop culture with anime, cartoons, comics. And so how um, involved or how involved are you with the historic aspect of anime and Japanese culture? Yeah. Do you, do you spend time reading, and I'm sure you do, looking back and mm -hmm. how does that play out in your, not only your work, mm -hmm. but your reverence for what you're doing? Uh, you know, that's a really good question. I, part of what I do, I almost feel like a pop culture archaeologist. Uh, what uh, I often did with Speed Racer and also what I do with Robotech is I uh, am often going back into the history of the production, uh, finding out why it was successful in the first place, uh, trying to capture uh, what that was in the beginning, and what worked with audiences back then, you know, maybe the audience is different now, maybe it's a different generation now, but at its very core, the, the core storytelling, uh, those remain unchanged. <clears throat> so uh, with Speed Racer, uh, there were so many different ways in which it had tried, it, there were attempts to reinvent it, uh, you know, update it and so on, and uh, I guess the reason why the version that I worked on uh, back in 98 did well was uh, I decided to research the original heavily, more so than had been done before, even go back as far as the original Japanese roots of its production and apply that towards my project. And, um, you know, people are like, why are you going through so much trouble? This is just a comic miniseries. And I said, no, you know what, the audience is going to perceive this and they're going to appreciate that. And uh, that did very well. And same with Robotech. Uh, there was a lot of licensing during the 90s, you know, uh, where um, the, uh, the licensing folks were just not, they were aware that it was a good business, but they were not that aware of the nuances of the property. And I think uh, it, it's important, you know, to know your own property. Uh, and uh, with the new Robotech licensing that has happened since, er, you know, the early 2000s, uh, we, it was going, just going right back to the roots with the look of the comics, with the way the uh, television series was promoted on home video. And, uh, uh, that has worked out very well. Uh, I, I think it's really important uh, when uh, creative people get involved. Uh, one of the diseases that writers have is they want to put their stamp on it. Uh, and it's okay to put a unique twist on it to offer audiences something new. That's what audiences want. They want, you know, along with something that's familiar, if it's a existing franchise, they also want something new. They want a new experience because they've already experienced what they have before. But one of the diseases is trying to put their own stamp on it. And uh, I think it's really important to go back to an existing property, uh, you know, study it, uh, deconstruct it, understand what made it work, and embrace that and let that have its own life and breathe its own direction, uh, you know, with the writer kind of steering it. Uh, rather than to, you know, let audiences say, hey, this is my thing, this is my shtick, this is who I am, hey, check it out, you know. Because uh, once you understand the characters of an existing franchise extremely well, understand what they're, make them tick, uh, and most important of all, find out what their character motivations are, then they end up actually writing themselves. It makes your job easier. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've just opened up here, mm -hmm. and it's, um, so everything that you've said so far is universally applicable to anything that anyone does in life. Mm -hmm. And you have given some really good advice, actually really important advice to anyone doing anything. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, where did you find out about this knowledge? The ability, or the in, was it instinctive that you felt, 
I have to deconstruct this. I have to go back. I have to do all of the digging to find out exactly how this came about to try to get its essence. Did you just recognize that as a natural thing, or did you have a mentor? I oh, no. Did I, somebody, I I I had. Did somebody I had, say to you, yeah. this is this is the proper path to do? Yeah, I had many mentors, and I always look for mentors. Uh, there are always there is always going to be someone wiser in this business who has been in it longer than you have, and it's important to look for people who are like that. You know. You can be on top of your field, you can be successful. The worst thing that can happen is you become cocky and you stop learning because then there's going to be a younger generation of kids who are going to surpass you. That's inevitable. Life is always that way. Um, and um, uh, I always look for someone like that. Uh, like, uh, and going back to your, uh, what you had mentioned earlier, it is instinctual. Uh, people will watch things and they will realize that there are things that they gravitate towards. Hey, this actually works. No, that doesn't work. And people instinctively recognize what is good storytelling, what is bad storytelling, um, but they don't know why. You know, so the instinct is there. And uh, understanding why, that just comes from a lot of it. You know, watching lots of movies, watching lots of good movies, watching lots of bad movies. Actually, you know what's interesting? I enjoy listening to making of, uh, making of uh, commentary tracks on films. Not a very good films. I, I do like to listen to them, but I especially like to listen to them on train wreck movies, where movies where there was extraordinary um, ambition, but the film just came out a complete mess. Because it's really interesting because uh, the people involved are very apologetic. They don't go, hey, this was awesome. This worked out great. Yeah, and th this guy who I worked with was, was a great guy. That guy was a great guy. He was a great cinematographer, whatever. But then when you uh, listen to the commentary tracks on uh, movies where everything went wrong, they go, yeah, don't do this. No, don't do that. No, this didn't work out. That didn't work out. It's extremely educational. Sure. So um, I would say be very well read. It's important to be well read. You know, because uh, instinctively you know why things work and don't work, but when you're very well read, you start seeing patterns and you start to recognize them. Uh, you know, being very well read, or in, for this generation, being very well watched, you know, having watched a lot of good and bad films, you know, all like uh, Roger Ebert just passed. He's probably seen, you know, his share of good and bad films, and he'll watch them all, both good and bad, and right. that informs him, you know. So you, you, you really think, and, and okay, so you really believe that this kind of understanding of history and, and, and just your overall, you know, knowledge base <coughs> of your subject mm -hmm. is, is how, how important is it because, uh, in the creative process? Because a lot of people believe, or, or a lot of people kind of think that, well, Creativity is in and of its own entity, and it's a burst. Yeah, you can write great um, original stories, but if you re really think about it, you know, um, you know, all stories come from somewhere. Uh, are they just a retelling of one's own life experiences? You know, that can be an original story, or if you're taking a story that already exists and adapting it, that's all. You know, there's a great deal of responsibility there, um, and uh, you know. Um, there's no reason to look down on that either because, I mean, if you really think about Romeo and Juliet, did Shakespeare come up with it? No. He was the Walt Disney of his day. He would repackage a pre-existing story, write it well for the mass audience, and so that, hence people remember Romeo and Juliet, not Romeus and Juliet, the story that preceded it. So, um, in your career, what has been your low point? When, what was the, 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 when you can look back on your career and say, gee, you know, that was rough. Low point? Hmm. That's a good answer right yeah. there. That's a you know great what? I, answer. okay. Because you, you know, okay. to have low to dig point, it up is good. Low point, okay. Low point is, um, I don't think there was a low point. I think there were low points. Uh, it's usually when, and this happens to all creative people, is when they hit a point when uh, 
they're struggling to find out what their next project is going to be. You know, when you're working, when you're in the when you're in a crunch, when you're busy in the middle of something, that's exciting. But then when you just wrapped and you're in that lull, uh, you know, you fall into a rut. Uh, I I actually think that's actually good because then you just kind of go, wow, what do I do next? It makes you, it forces you to think outside of the box. Uh, you know, or oftentimes when I, uh, sometimes it happens where I get a project. Uh, I won't say which one it is, but it's when I get a project where they go, oh, this is good. this makes so much sense. It's going to make a lot of money, you know, and the project rose not out of. Sometimes you have to make both work. The business has to work. You have to make sure that the market is there, and you have the creative idea for it. But uh, you know, because otherwise uh, you're going to end up with a brilliant piece that nobody sees. Uh, but then at the same time, uh, sometimes when there's a project that's born purely out of the business with, without making sure that the concept was put together, that's when some really expensive, not good stuff comes out. You know, I think the viewers need to recognize what you, had just, what you just said. And one of the things that you didn't say was, or you didn't mention, rejection. I mean, yeah. and, and this is something that I think young artists have Reject to deal with. Oh, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I really think okay, okay. it might yes. have been honestly missed because yeah. I think successful people, artists in particular, that's not even on their radar. They, well, that, it, it appeared to be a rejection maybe to someone else, but no, I was just processing and learning and moving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do you want to mention it? Oh, uh, no, no, no. Rejection. Have, have okay, all right, all right. That, that, is, that is very, very, okay, I, I was a little bit lucky. A lot of the projects I had, uh, I didn't have to hit the pavement, look around, to, you know, uh, stand in line and say, you know, hey, can you look at my work? Please give me work, you know, that kind of situation. I think that's incredibly humbling. Uh, that's something you have to do. But also, uh, this is where you know uh, young artists uh, don't just stand in line with everyone else. Learn to hustle. Um, uh, when you go to these events, a lot of, you know when you go to San Diego Comic Con, when there's 140,000 people crammed in there, it's really hard to meet uh, the important people, uh, the people you want, you know, who make business decisions that make things happen. Uh, think a little bit outside the box. There are smaller venues that they go to. These little wizard worlds. Or, you know, I, I tell a lot of people, comic fans, go to Long Beach Comic Con. It's, you know, uh, you know, San Diego Comic Con is the event. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But at Long Beach Comic Con, because it's so much smaller, um, it's easier to meet people and make those connections. Uh, you know, uh, don't uh, look down on schmoozing. That's part of life in any business you're at because those connections that you make, some a uh, friend that you made somebody somewhere might end up at a company that becomes important later. Uh, that happened to me many times where I was, uh, I was just nice to people that I had met in passing and then lo and behold they're working at a company and an opportunity comes up out of that. Uh, there are, you know, uh, you hear about creative people. There are many, you know, there are people who are very difficult to work with and there are people who are very easy to work with. And uh, you know, one of the things I try to do is when I just have a lot of work and uh, things are rough, uh, one of the things I try to, you know, I'm just not available, but I try to be nice about it because you never know when, you know, uh, those other opportunities might come back and uh, be an opportunity for you. Because you'll hear lots of stories about creative people in the industry where they were just really difficult, just um, Difficult people on a personal level, and then at some point later in their careers, nobody wants to work with them ever again. You know, uh, so that's you know uh, important thing for people, and that's maybe that's a broader life lesson thing. You know, I'm glad you said that because that's what we have going on right here. Yeah, so this is it, really something. So yeah, but but in terms of the rejection thing, be persistent because you know th there's going to be people who say, oh no no no, this will never work. Nah no, nah, next you know whatever. Be persistent because. Uh, you know, Google how many times uh, Frank Baum was rejected for Wizard of Oz before finally he found a publisher and all those other publishers before he got finally picked are probably kicking themselves, you know. Right, right. And, uh, you know, the, the stories like that are endless. Um, there's two things you can do from the rejection is one, if they really, um, what I really like are constructive rejections. 
like, uh, you know, sometimes I'll uh, try to say, hey, can this licensing work? And they'll, no, the mar that, that won't work in our market right now. And they'll give me, you know, information. Like they'll say, hey, uh, the market is going this direction. Uh, stuff like this is doing well. Like, let's say right now it's a lull in sci fi, it's big on fantasy. And you go, hmm, okay, that's good to know. You know, either, you know, like Star Wars is doing, uh, space exploration is out. You know, look at how hard NASA is, um, you know, starving to get budgeted, but fantasy is in. And you look uh, you know, at the Star Wars prequel, instead of so much space fights, everybody's donning, you know, uh, Jedi outfits. They're starting to all look like Gandalf, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, well, okay. Uh, but anyway, besides the merits of Star Wars prequels whatsoever, but, you know, you notice that they've adopted a lot of fantasy elements into the Star Wars saga. Uh, and it seems like uh, the people there are swinging with the trends. It's good to take constructive feedback when you get, you know, when they say, no, it's not going to work, and you learn. Uh, or in other cases where they just don't give you the time of day, but you think you got something that's working, be persistent. That's great. That's great advice. Okay, so now let's try to move off of this really great stuff. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we could go on about this, because this, this is really, for I me, can't wait to get to the crummy stuff. I love this kind of like, you know, <laughs> how it really works yeah. for people right. and, and okay. philosophically how, we, how you get to All where right. you are. But so, um, how many shows do you do a year? Uh, Convention-wise? Yeah. Not that many. I got, I, I, got, uh, I got two little kids now, so I don't, don't do conventions like I used to. Maybe, I don't know, maybe half a dozen tops a year. And so, what, what will you do here? What is your... Uh, I, I present Robotech uh, uh, about the latest projects that we're doing uh, regarding Robotech. Uh, one thing I enjoy doing is I hold a work, workshop for uh, aspiring uh, comic and manga artists, uh, show them the techniques that I use. Um, uh, the computer equipment that was used a decade ago was extremely expensive. It's a lot cheaper now. It's within the reach of most college kids now, and so I show them how they can do most things that, you know, professionals uh, used to be the realm of professionals before. You're talking about software? Uh, yeah, so software, you know, technique, and just techniques, you know, just understanding how to get, get things done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the software you recommend? Uh, software, oh, well, the whole industry still uses Adobe Photoshop. Uh, there's okay. no ifs, ands, or buts around that. Uh, you know, they try to use something cheaper. You know, there's Manga Studio out there, which replicates a lot of functionality and has uh, tablet-friendly features. But uh, in terms of uh, art production, uh, Photoshop is still the gold standard. The oddest thing a fan requested from me. Oh, you know what? You, you, you get the you get the uh, you get you get the typical uh, uh, convention things like. Uh, uh, you know what? Maybe I better not say that on camera. That, that was a weird. Those were weird requests. Uh, okay, uh, but I, we 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 do have our share of unusual fans. Uh, they're they're uh, as Mark Hamill would call them, um, ultra passionate fans. He calls them UPFs. Uh, and uh, there, I I understand the passion where it's coming from, uh, and I wholly support it as long as they can balance it with, uh, you know, um, decorum and you know real life. So in now, when did you get here? Pittsburgh, when did you arrive? Pittsburgh, uh, just yesterday. Yesterday? Yeah. Have you had a chance to go around and see anything? I, I've seen Pittsburgh before. I've been here before. A, a very beautiful city. Yeah. So what did you eat for lunch? What did I have for lunch? Yeah. Did you eat anything? Or did you go to a restaurant or anything? Uh, I'm actually trying to eat light. I had a banana uh, okay. for lunch. Uh, let's see, for breakfast I had a clementine. So you, don't, you haven't seen the local sites yet? Have the local sites? Uh, I, I, I've had a Philly cheesesteak before. Uh, but in Philadelphia. Yeah, in Philadelphia. <laughs> I, I, know, I know we're Pittsburgh, the other end of the state, yeah. No, but, I, people say that all the time. It's kind of uh, weird. Huh? We're like the stepchild of Philadelphia. Oh, oh I see, I see. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. Anything else you want to add? I mean, oh, so, so, what, so I, okay, specific to Pittsburgh, what would you recommend to me? What, what should I get? That, what should you get here? What should I get here? Well, um, I'll tell you, there's a little place. Um, 
It's called. Um... Oh, actually, I'm gonna get my phone or write this down so I don't. Okay. There's a little restaurant, and, and are you staying at the William Penn? Uh, no, I am staying in. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I am staying at the the, the, the double tree. The double tree. Yeah, okay. the, the, the double tree. So, uh, it, it, you know, big party tonight at midnight. It's going to be jamming. We're going to try and make sure the hotel doesn't throw us out. <laughs> I right. would say because you're yeah. in the downtown area, yeah. you can go to a place called uh -huh. La Cucina Flagraia. La Cucina Flagraia. Flagraia. Okay. Very nice. Uh, How about something that's unique to Pittsburgh? Something that's. That's very unique. Oh, it, it is unique.